I'm Wendy Murdoch, and I'm here with my good friend Sean Patrick. We're both here at the Equine Affair, and we've been presenting the past couple of days. And I thought it'd be a really great idea to drag him over to my booth and have him meet Elmer and Happy Horse, and just talk to us a little bit about uh, about different things. So, how's it going? Going well. Yeah. yeah really well. Yeah. I've uh, been teaching a little bit on the trail riding side of things. We've been talking about softness and forward and um, relaxing your horse on the trail. Oh, awesome. And uh, I was able to sit in on a couple of years yep. and hear some of the same message I've heard from your teachings in the past at, down at my place and on video. And I've, uh, I really appreciate your teaching. You've, uh, yeah, so I've been coming down to Sean's place for two years now. Yeah, been and a we've while, been yeah. using your facility and you've been so gracious to us to just, you know, cut us loose there. <laughs> it's my great Florida group. Hi, guys. I hope you tuned in. And um, so I met Sean when I came down there, and uh, we just hit it off really well. I, I, I think we're on the same page philosophically, and it's really nice to find somebody open-minded and interested in learning. So it's been yeah, a pleasure. Yeah, it's been it's it's been really enjoyable for me because your your view on everything is is so different, and not different in a in a bad way. Just you come at it from such a different point of view. You're really interested in the biomechanics and about the Feldenkrais method, which is very enlightening to a rider or to a human. Of not even involved in horses, about how the brain tells the body to operate a certain way and you have to show them different options. And It's changed. Very small things that you've taught me have really changed the way I view while I'm riding. Oh, so cool. I've, I've been really aware of, it didn't always sink in the next day. No, sometimes it, I have people six months later email yeah. me and say they finally got it. Yeah. But it's really changed how I view some of the training steps and some of my own riding. And I'm still trying to get a handle on it exactly what I think now okay as far as because you know what I think is right or wrong evolves yeah oh sure so now I'm trying to figure out how do I become better in the saddle and better with my mechanics to influence the horse so do you have an example of something that I sure. showed you that okay something yeah. really simple that yeah. I'm sure all of you uh, dressage students are fully aware of but I uh, grew up uh, riding in a western saddle Something as simple as knees forward and down. Oh, I love knees forward and down. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Like, just getting me to focus on getting into a better position that doesn't block the horse and helps the horse. Getting that kind of through my head and then practicing that as I rise to the trot. Just I noticed that you're riding better, actually. You did? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's thanks to you. And so I'm now at least aware of it. Yeah. You can't change things if you're not aware of it. Exactly. And so I think that's where the Feldenkrais comes in, right? Absolutely. It's all about awareness. And so this is Elmer. And, um... For those folks who don't know what knees forward down is, I'm just going to take him here. I'll, I'll take him off his post. Poor Elmer. It's hot? Oh, Ned would be easier to work with. Yeah, is he handy? I don't think he is. That's okay. We'll just, uh, let's, let's have to turn it so I can get to that fly. Okay. Comes right off. Okay, so when you're sitting in the saddle, and you know, I noticed this with a couple of your students this morning. I was like, I was desperate to go out there. I was good. I didn't do anything, but I was like, I could see that they were riding and the foot was pushed a bit forward. And so what happens when that foot's pushed forward is if the rider's trying to rise, they can't get over the over the thigh, over the knee, because the femur's pushing back up in the hip socket. Let's get a stand out of the way. There we go. So what happens is, if you're pushing on the stirrup and your legs turned out, it's going to push your seat back in the saddle, and then you pitch forward. And you could see that with some of the riders that are getting a bit forward. Yep. And then the horse gets heavy on the forehand and can't put the neck down because they're having to catch the rider's weight. Right. But as soon as that leg comes back underneath and the knee goes forward down, now the hip can open and it clears. Yep. And this hip joint is so important in riding because if this is sticky or blocked, that's going to affect contact. No matter whether you're bridleless or with a bit. Can I put you on the spot? Yeah. Okay, so in, in reining riders, you'll see a lot of our knees turned outward. Yeah. And can you talk to me about the rights and wrongs of that? Absolutely. Okay. So the minute you start to turn the knee outward, and I'm just going to get them a little more balanced here and get that hand out of the way. I've externally rotated my knee. Now look what happens in that hip joint. It rotates back. Okay, and as it rotates back, it's going to block that forward down motion of the knee. Okay, so if this femur is lined up, here, I'm going to let you hold the top part, okay? Okay, that's good. Right. Cool. Here okay, here I can swing. I can't swing. It's blocked that. What if you don't care to swing? Well, if I'm riding canter, if I'm riding canter, I can't get through as easy here. I can ride that bigger stride on my fast circle. Here, 
it gets sticky. Okay. And you think about your flying changes. Okay. You know, everybody wants to open the door to, for the flying change, but as soon as you open that door that way, you have to throw your weight somewhere else. So uh, whether it's a slide stop or a roll back, I'm still looking for those legs, those knees to go forward down. And I think a lot of the reason why they're externally rotating like that is that twist in the flat plane. Remember when we shimmed your stirrups? Yep. So when the foot is angled on the stirrup, it's angled this way, right. then you, you're, you have to do something to get there, right? You have to like, as soon as my foot's out like this yep. to get on the stirrup, now my knee's turned out. Now I'm gonna push the leg forward, right? And brace against the horse. So when I go to do my slide stop, yes, my horse will learn how to do it, okay? But I'm actually inhibiting those hind legs from really tucking underneath. It's harder for them. Okay. And I want to alleviate any resistance for that horse. So okay. I remember asking you, I don't know if you remember this last time, I said, okay, well, there's being correct. Yep. And it's really hard to stay correct all the time when you need to adjust to get something yeah. done. And you said, well, then there's reality. Right. So when I want to apply a spur pressure or a tap, I don't mean a heavy pressure, no, but, but then the you, tap of the spur. No, but then to get your spur on so the horse, you're going to have to turn your leg. Don't, Bill Steinkraus said it best. Okay. Use an aid and put it back. Perfect. That's okay. what I. That's how I. Think yep. About if it. you got to use your leg, you use the leg. Then you put it back because okay. if you hold it here, you tighten that hip. Okay. Um, I'm thinking about that slide stop again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we don't have the best surface because our surfaces are all grippy. But basically, well, just stand up for a second. And if you were to think about showing me a slide, you're the horse from the waist down. Okay, okay what do you have to do? What do the hind feet have to do? Hind feet have to do. The hind feet have to come forward. Right, and you had to bend your knees. Right? Do it again. And you have to let your pelvis come underneath, right? Yeah. And feel there's even might be a little bit of grip with the toes. Right? To really tuck down. Am I the rider or the horse? Well the bottom half still drop the horse. Okay. Right? Yeah. So you're you're on your whole foot, but the horse would be on his foot, which would be the end of your middle toe. Right? So you can kind of feel it. You're going to tuck your hocks a little bit. Okay. okay. Now turn your knees up. Now what's going to happen? Is that as easy? It opens more on the knee and it closes more on the mid thigh. Yeah, and what happens in the lower back? That's the flex of the knee. That's right. So what does the horse's lower back have to do? I'm not sure. Oh, well, let's look at the horse what then. The lower, yeah, the back, I don't know. Oh. Would it hollow? Well, here's our horse, <laughs> right here. Okay. All right. This joint here, the, the lumbosacral joint on the horse has the greatest amount of flexion in the spine, right? Okay. I mean, they can literally hinge here. So when that horse really tucks, he's not only hinging here, he's also rounding this lower back. Okay. Right? So you see that nice sweep underneath with the hindquarters. Right. And so as he does that, he, happy horse here can't, right? But this is going to hinge right here, this is going to round, and that's going to bring that hind leg way underneath him so those hind legs really slide. Yep. Now you know how bad it is if you see one of those stifles starting to go out, right? Because that horse is going to, instead of doing 11s, he's going to start splaying. And that's going to put a tremendous amount of uh, force into the hip, knee, and stifle that's not good for the horse. I mean, how many horses have hock pain because they've gone like that, right? Yep. So when you think about that's what the horse has to do, and then we think about the rider again, if our feet are doing this, Yep. We're splaying. We want that horse to do 11s. Yep. So if we think of coming right down in here in 11s, then we're going to round the lower back, tuck the pelvis, let the knees go forward, and allow that hind leg really come underneath us. Okay. When we brace on that stirrup, we can still tuck. And that's what you're, you're kind of doing this conflict between flexion and extension. If you brace the leg, now your knees have stiffened this way, right? But you're still trying to tuck. And it's not nearly as easy to do as if you're right here. So um, from a martial arts perspective, doing, I got, I got my new skirt on. <laughs> what is that? Isn't that cool? I got that at Arctic Riding. That's awesome. So it's great because it's canvas and now I can kneel on the ground and not get my jeans and pants all dirty when I'm doing surefoot and awesome. stuff like that. Yeah. Really slight. But it makes it hard to do a demo. So if I lift my skirt, hang on, actually, we'll just take it. I got pants on underneath, so we don't have to worry. <laughs> I thought they were chaps at first. Yeah, they're kind of like... Or, or a driving skirt, you know? Yeah, it's up. like it can do lots of things. That's cool. Okay? So if I want to do a slide, I'm going to come in and I'm going to get right there. Right. Find my horse, right? Right. Okay. And then everything can come underneath me. Get around his back and tuck his pelvis and his stifles have to bend so he can really hold the ground. Right. Well, if I come up and I go like this, 
right? I'm, I'm either losing my balance or have to throw my weight back, but I'm not very stable like this. I can still round, yep. but I'm not stable, okay. okay? And I think the reason so many of these rainers are bracing on the stirrups is right back to the beginning of the stirrup not being level. So you're trying to get your foot on the stirrup and it's already angled. And at that point, you've already got a misalignment between your knee and your foot, and then you have to push on the stirrup to stabilize yourself. But if you could come right down in here like this, and let your knees go forward again, yep. right? You'll just come right down into that horse and he'll feel you really secure. And then he can track straight. Because that straightness in that stock is so important. Well, since I was talking to you last time a little bit about this, I've been working on it. Oh, good, so how's been, it going? <laughs> good, it's, it's not easy to do. No. Because sometimes it's easier to brace a little bit on your feet. Sure. But I've been working on trying to use my lower back crunch and, and yep. you know try to put myself in a position that doesn't block the horse right and encourages that that you know, horse to come right underneath yeah and that this is the only movement since you know a reining side stop is extreme and reining is now an extreme sport yeah. so you know for a basic stop I don't teach tucking the pelvis I just teach a basic stop from the lower back but in reining we really have to think of matching what that horse's body is doing and so we have to think about really tucking the pelvis and coming under but making sure those knees can go forward so that that horse keeps those stifles closing and tucking underneath them. Great. Cool. Work in progress. Yeah, no, it's great, <laughs> great. I love the questions because I, that's how we kind of share that information and work yeah. it through. And each time, you know, it's like another little piece that'll click into place and you'll feel something when you go out and ride again and that's yeah. how we get better. Yep. Yeah. I'm certain to kind of, the light has to come on about what you could change to make it better. Right. And it doesn't always happen in you know. No, no, it takes time. Yeah. It's in process. It's fun. Great. Thank so you. so thanks a lot for tuning in. It's great to have Sean Patrick here. He's over in Bricker Building. I'm in the Bricker, yep. What's, we have a what's your booth number? 935 maybe. 935 and we're here in the Celeste Building at 304. And please be sure to leave a comment about this video. And if you have any questions about riding slide stops, circles, or turns, just let me know and I can see if I can answer that. So, so Patrick King came by earlier. I don't know if you know him. He was hoping to meet you, but he had to do something else today. But anyway, when he came by, he said, there's a question of the day. So what's the question of the day? My question of the day? You get to ask a question of the day. To you? To anybody. To anybody. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Okay. How about... Oh, I got to think of a good one. I, uh... Oh, that's a good one. Question of the day. I'm trying to think of a burning question that I've had. Yeah. I've had so many burning questions about the body of a horse oh. and how that affects how they move, and I'm just trying to come up with something clever. But well, it's okay. Um, well, you talked to me last time a lot about the, the rotation of the rib cage. Oh yeah. And I've been really aware of that and trying to realign things better. Right. So, do you have a little hint or a little adage or something that I can use for myself or my students to help us? keep that in mind or yeah you always want to think of your, your saddle horn staying vertical to the sky okay okay you yeah. want that saddle horn nice thing about Western saddles is it's really easy to see what the rib cage is doing because the saddle is actually moving with the rib cage right. so you want to think about that horn always staying upright pointing toward the sky your horn cap okay okay that's a good way to look at it yeah yep. so if if the horn cap is leaning then the horse is leaning how would I fix that by increasing my outside aids and just trying to put them in alignment that way? It, it depends. Like if the horn is leaning to the left, obviously the rib cage is rotated left. Yep. And so now I might have to ask my horse to bend a little bit on the left to, to soften the ribs on that side and then shift my weight a little to the opposite side to get it to derotate. But the horn will indicate whether you're right or wrong. Horn shows you. Okay. Yep. Very right. clearly. Good deal. Great. Thank All right. You. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks, guys. Take care.